से राधा कुंज बिहारी जय राधा मार कुंज बिहारी कुपी चंदा गिरी बड़ा धारी गोपी चनबा गिरी बड़ा धारी चुशोधानंदना प्रज जन रंजना चुशोधानंदना प्रज जन रंजना चुसर नंदना भज जना रंजना जमुना थीरा बन छी जमुना थीरा बन छी यू कैन चै विथ मी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राधा मारवा कुंज बिहारी कुपी जन बलवा गिरिवर धारी कुपी जन बलवा गिरिवर धारी शुशोधानंदना ब्रज जन रंजना शुशोधानंदना ब्रज जन रंजना शुशोधानंदना ब्रज जन रंजना शुशोधानंदना ब्रज जन रंजना जमुना थीरा पन चारी जमुना थीरा बन छी जे राध मारवा कुंज बिहारी जय राध मारवा कुंज बिहारी श्री श्री राध माधव की जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भगवतम की जय गौ भक्त वृंद की जय निताय गो प्रेमानंदी हरि हरि बो सुबदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामीनी नमने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी पृछादिन विशेष संगीवादि पृछाद राइट द वर्स डाउन So it's one dash nineteen thirty seven. People are sending me Facebook messages during class. It's not good. Okay, so. I thought I put the verse. Did I put the verse? Well, the problem is I have a solution because as soon as you come on and say hello, then... But I have a solution. I'm prepared. Look at this. Can you read that or is it backwards? <laughs> it looks backwards to me. How do we get it not to be backwards? Turn it upside down, put it this way. You see it through the back of the page. I guess this didn't work, did it? Tell me, how do you see this? Do you see it backwards? Backwards, yeah. See, if we had a real, if I use a real camera, this wouldn't happen. Does anybody know how not to make it backwards? I'm just using my phone. Use a mirror. 
So I put it in a mirror and then hold the mirror up. I don't have a mirror. What about my computer? That's probably going to be the same thing, right? Yeah. I have to turn it around backwards. <laughs> okay, so you, one of you intelligent devotees is going to figure out there must be a function on the camera so it's not backwards. I have an idea. I'll turn the camera around. This could work. Hold on. Hold on. You're not going to see me, but we're going to try it this way. Wait. Hey, look at that. It works. All I need is one of you over here to hold it. Okay, I gotta bring this closer. Look at that. So I'm gonna chant and then you're gonna respond, right? Ata pritschami sam sidim, and I'll chant with you in your response. Ata pritschami sam sidim. Yoginam paramam gurum, yoginam paramam gurum, purushasye hayat karyam, purushasye hayat karyam, mriyamanasya sarvata, mriyamanasya sarvata. So do it two more times. Nata prischami sam sidhim. Ata pritschami sam sidhim, joginam paramam gurum, joginam paramam gurum, purushashye ha yat karyam, purushashye ha yat karyam, mriyamanasya sarvata, mriyamanasya sarvata. Ata pritschami sam sidhim, Joginam Vatam Prichami Shang Sidim Joginam Paramam Gurum Joginam Paramam Gurum Purushasheha Yat Karyam Purushasheha Yat Karyam Mriyama Mriyamanasya Sarvata Mriyamanasya Sarvata I'm totally prepared. Look what I have next. <clears throat> this is like a real Bhagavatam class. You're looking out my window here. It's cloudy out. You can't see anything. It's like a real Bhagavatam class. Look at this. Ataha. I have to hold this straight. Therefore. And then you say, and I'll wait for you to say therefore. Prichchami. And I'm going to wait for you to chant Prichchami and then beg to inquire. Sam Siddim, the way of perfection. And then you were going to repeat, right? Joginam of the saints. Paramam, the supreme. Gurum, the spiritual master. Purushasha of a person. Iha in this life. Should I repeat with you? Would that be better? So we all get it together. Yat, yat, whatever, whatever. Karyam, karyam, duty, duty. Riyamanasya, Riyamanasya, of one who is going to die. Of one who is going to die. Sarvata, Sarvata, in every way. Now, we have the translation. And I will explain why I chose this verse in a moment. Translation. You are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. I'm therefore begging you to show the way of perfection for all persons and especially for one who is about to die. So let's repeat. You are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. 
I am therefore begging you to show the way of perfection, show the way of perfection. For all persons, and especially for one who is about to die. Okay, so this I believe, let's go back, you can see me. This I believe is the, is the second to last verse of the last chapter of the first canto. And this is, as you could tell, this is Prakshir Maharaj inquiring. This is where Bhagavatam actually begins. So he's asking him because he's about to die. He said, what, what must I do? What is the duty of someone who's about to die? What is, yes, what is the verse? He said, you understand, you know, I'm showing me the way of perfection. And as we mentioned yesterday, Prakshir Maharaj chose not to counteract the curse, but took it as Krishna's mercy that he must want me to die because he had protected me when I was young. So now he must want me to die. So there must be a purpose in this and then I must prepare myself for dying by going to a sadhu and finding out what should I do, what's the best thing. So this is an example of what anyone should do when they know they're going to die. And I wanted to read two other verses that come after this because um, there's a sequence of thought. And I've chosen this verse, as you may be able to understand now. Um, because of the deaths that are going on in the world, because of the coronavirus, and it's obviously it's on everyone's mind, especially so many are in lockdown. And so you have a lot of time to read about it and get the statistics of what's happening to who. And I wanted to talk about death because now it's something more real for all of us, potentially, because this virus does kill a certain percentage of people, different percentages in different age brackets. And so it's, it's definitely, there's a, you know, apparently a greater threat of death now than there was a few weeks ago. So I want to go to the next verse, which is, see, it's not the next verse, Maybe the next verse or two verses later. It's the Srimad Bhagavatam 2.1.1. I can get exactly, find exactly. It's interesting. Yes. Anyway. So, Sima Bhagavatam, second canto, so we're just a few verses ahead if you have it on your phone or computer. And so Sukadeva Goswami is answering the question. Bharyane shate prashna krita loka hitam nepa. Atmavat samata punsam. Forgot to get the last line. Chota vadishu yat para. So, Sukadeva Goswami is saying, Basically, he's saying, wow, this is a great question. I'm glad you answered this. Most people don't ask this question. Um, the doctor says you're going to die. And then most people don't go to a sadhu and say, what should I do? Yes. So Katie put the verse up there. My dear king, your question is glorious because it is very beneficial to all kinds of people. The answer to this question is the prime subject matter for hearing, and it is approved by all transcendentalists. Now, this is really interesting. Sukadev so Goswami is saying the prime, <laughs> the, the most important thing you're supposed to hear about is, uh, or the most important question you're supposed to ask is, what do I do? How do I face death? Even if you don't know you're going to die, like Prakshir Maharaj had seven days. But even if you don't know, it's the best question. So Sukadeva Goswami is immediately praising this question, basically saying, like, nobody asked this question, and when people find out they're going to die, they're not really thinking about what life is all about and what's the purpose and where's the sadhu and I need to listen to him. Mostly they're lamenting that I have to go, give up my sense gratification. 
So therefore, Shukadeva Goswami is praising Prichit Maharaj. He said, this is, this is the question. And he says, and he's saying, the answer to this question is the main thing you're supposed to hear about. Uh, we're all hearing about coronavirus, so I don't know, maybe if we die today, we'll become a coronavirus in our next life. So, this, you know, this is a, a, such an obvious, simple instruction, but I think it's important that um, Sukhita Goswami is, is uh, saying, Varyan, Varyan means glorious. This question is such a good question. You ever like meet somebody that's interested and they ask really good questions and you, you get you feel really good, you feel really excited, you think this person's intelligent, they're asking the right questions. And so Sugade so Goswami's yes, this is the right question. And just like Arjuna asked the right questions, Prikshit Marsh asked the right questions. Um he's asking questions for us. He's is inquire, he knows how to ask the right question. So Sukadev is just saying, yeah, this is the right question. Then I skipped to 216. This is a famous verse. And we're going to base most of what I say off this verse and one other verse. And I've I've got references from different lectures and letters where Prabhupada's talking about this topic. And I want to elaborate on it. And I want to put it in the context that I think will really help us. So this is 216, Etavan Sakya Yogya Abhyam Swadharma Parinishthaya Janma Labha Param Punsam Ante Narayana Smriti. So you may recognize this verse from the last line, Ante Narayana Smriti. Ante means at the end. Narayan, of course, means Narayan, and Smriti means remember. So this was quoted a lot by Prabhupada, like, Whatever you do, if you remember Krishna at the time of death, that's a success. It doesn't matter <laughs> if that's if your activities bring you to remembering Krishna, everything's a success. If it doesn't, everything's a failure in a sense. That's what the verse means. But let's read the translation. The highest perfection of human life achieved either by complete knowledge of matter and spirit, by a practice of mystic powers, or by perfect discharge of occupational duty, is to remember the personality of Godhead at the end of life. So, however you, you come to this position, whether it's by jnana, by yoga, by karma, or by bhakti, if you remember Krishna, that's the perfection. You know. So, what the, the first thing that stands out, which is obvious, is that in our culture, nobody really talks about dying. Everybody talks about accumulation and getting, doing, and doing now, and achieving now. And in one sense, perfection is accumulation, uh, a position, wealth, influence, power. But Bhagavatam never defines that as success. Bhagavatam always defines this as success, if you can remember Krishna when you die. And so the example, which you probably heard, life is a test, death is the final exam. If you remember Krishna, you're passing the final exam. And I want to put that in some context. But first I want to, I want to read one line. I've chosen some things from the purport that are relevant to what I want to talk about, so I'm not reading the whole purport. Everyone is anxious to to achieve the highest perfection of his particular activity. And it is indicated herein that such perfection is the Narayana Smriti, for which everyone must endeavor his best. In other words, life should be molded in such a manner that one is able to progressively remember the personality of God in every step of life. So, Prabhupada has made a point over and over again that you're not going to remember Krishna unless you practice throughout your whole life. And so the Krishna conscious movement is a practice of remembering Krishna. And then, so if you're practiced to remember Krishna, then at the end you will remember Krishna. And as this verse says, the perfection of life is you remember Krishna. So that's the final exam. If you remember Krishna, then you've passed the test. Now here's the context I want to put it in. Because we 
want to live a long time. We want our mother and father and friends and brothers and sisters and gurus and everyone. We want them to live a long time. And I want to put this in context because, as you know, Prabhupada has said the trees may live for 5,000 years and Shankar Acharya and Mahaprabhu, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu only lived for 48 years. So whose life is better? So Prabhupada never put much emphasis or importance on living a long time. He always put emphasis on this point, remembering Krishna. And so if someone dies in Krishna consciousness, whether they're 20 or 40 or 60 or 80, that's glorious. And if they don't die in Krishna consciousness, they could live for hundreds of years and it's not glorious. So that's the context of this discussion because it's likely, and I think it's already happened in London, that someone we know is going to be leaving their body from this virus. It's just the odds that this could happen are, are likely. And with Facebook, even if we don't know them personally, it'll be some devotee and we'll feel bad. And of course, we feel bad because they leave their loved ones. They may be fathers and mothers and so forth. But I want to put this in a different context. And I can do this by reading some things Prabhupada has said. And also we would quote one other verse from Bhagavatam. So this is something Prabhupada said in relation, that I feel is in relation to this. So this is Krishna conscious practice that you practice. Anything you practice, just like you practice something. And in the examination hall, you write very nicely immediately. But if you have no practice, then how can you write? Similarly, if you practice chanting, then even in sleeping, also you will chant Hare Krishna. There are three stages, awakening state, sleeping state, dreaming state, and unconscious state. Unconscious. The conscious, we are just pushing Krishna in the consciousness. So even in the unconscious stage, you will also have Krishna. The devotee was telling me a few weeks ago that a lot of times his son is a few years old, four or five, in his sleep, he's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada, you may have heard this example, is that Prabhupada said, you can train a parrot. I just heard this lecture yesterday or the day before. You can train a parrot to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. He said, but when the cat comes to eat the parrot, or whatever bird it is, then he doesn't chant Hare Krishna, he chants, ah, ah, ah. So we don't want to, so Prabhupada said, we don't want to be like that. Um, so again, the point Prabhupada's making here is, you practice, and if you practice, 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 then at time of death, you're so practiced to think of Krishna that that's naturally where your mind will go. And then if you remember Krishna when you die, that's perfection. So I'll continue reading this lecture. So if you are fortunately able to come to that perfectional state, which means conscious of Krishna at, at death, then this life is the end of your material existence. You enter into the spiritual world, you have your eternal life, blissful life, and dance with Krishna, that's all. Let me read this again, because this really, this really establishes kind of the basis of what I want to talk about, this, this last sentence. If you are fortunately able to come to that perfectional state, then this life at, is the end of your material existence. You enter into the spiritual world and have your eternal blissful life and dance with Krishna, that's all. Okay. So let's say one of us dies and we knew that at that moment that person died, as Prabhupada said, the light and the illumination. It's, he said, when you die and you're Krishna conscious, immediately you go to Krishna Leela. If we knew that person now was dancing with Krishna, wouldn't we think his life is a success? It wouldn't matter what age, right? Isn't it? And if you're a parent, your duty is to raise a Krishna conscious child. That's your duty. Or if you're a guru, your duty is to make your disciples Krishna conscious. So let's say your child dies and they're very young, but they died in Krishna consciousness. You did your duty. And if you knew they're now dancing with Krishna, wouldn't you feel or shouldn't you feel, well, this is the success of my parenting and this is the success of their life. They became Krishna conscious. 
So, Prabhupada always spoke within that context. He always, and we always live in the context of, I want to live forever. I don't want to die, I don't want to leave my friends. I don't want to leave this world, this is my home. We think that way. It's not our home at all. And as I've often said, no, you don't want to live forever here because if you live forever here, you have to work to maintain yourself. So you want to work forever? Go back to Godhead, you don't have to work. So really, when you think about it, there are better options. And we would rather choose eternal life with Krishna than in this world. So... I want to read one other verse, and then I got some other lectures by Prabhupada that elaborate on this, and it's very revealing what Prabhupada says. And I, I want to read a few things Prabhupada says because it creates context for what more what I want to talk about. So this is Srimad Bhagavatam, fifth canto, third chapter, verse twelve, five three twelve. And Katerina Katie is going to put it up there for you, the translation. There's a 20 second delay between when I speak and when you hear. So maybe I'll read the Sanskrit and that'll give Katerina time to put it up. The Sanskrit is in prose. Nata katan chit shakalana shutpatana jrimpana duravashtana dishu visvashanam nasmaran Naya Jvara Marana Dasayam Napishakala Kamala Kashmala Nirashanani Tavaguna Krita Namadhyayani Vanchana Gocharani Bhavantu No, she didn't get it up. Did she get it up? Katerina, where are you? Everyone, is that the right? No. Nope. Starts, dear Lord. Well, it's not up. Yeah, get up the English. Yeah, perfect. Dear Lord, we may, we may not be able to remember your name, form, and qualities due to stumbling, hunger, falling down. You're going to have to bring it back. I, just, I don't know if you can do that. Stumbling, hunger, falling down, yawning, or being in a miserable disease condition at the time of death. Where there is high fever. High fever, yeah, high fever. That's part of the coronavirus. As a side point, if you read the story about the Shiva Jvara, it said one of the blessings or benediction is you won't get fever. So I think maybe as a precaution, it doesn't hurt to read that story. And if we have faith, maybe we won't never we will never get a fever. Interesting, huh? So let me start over again because I interrupted that. Dear Lord, we may not be able to remember your name, form, and qualities due to stumbling, hunger, falling down, yawning, or being in a miserable disease condition at the time of death, when there is a high fever. We therefore pray unto you, O Lord. You are very affectionate to your devotees. Please help us remember you and utter your holy names, attributes, and activities, which can dispel all the reactions of our sinful lives. So I'm going to read one line from the purport, and it begins with the real success. So Katie, if you could find that. The real success in life is Ante Narayana Smriti. So this, if you don't know this saying, Ante Narayana Smriti, you can remember it. Ante at the end, Narayan, Narayan Smriti. Ante Krishna, Shamsundar Smriti. The real success in life is Ante Narayana Smriti, remembering the holy names, attributes, activities, and form of the Lord at the time of death. Although we may be engaged in the Lord's devotional service in the temple, material conditions are so tough and inevitable that we may forget the Lord at the time of death due to a disease condition or mental derangement. Therefore, we should pray to the Lord to be able to remember his lotus feet without fail at the time of death 
when we are in such a precarious condition in this regard when they see Bhagavatam 6, 2, 9, and 10 and 14 and 15. So you know the verse, you may know the verse because I recorded it. Krishna Turiya Pada Pankacha Pancharantam. That's the prayer of King Kulakshetra. King Kulakshetra was an Alvar, a great Alvar mean Alvar means uh, like a Mahajan, South Indian Mahajan. Great, great devotee. And he said, he was actually praying to die. He said, because if I die now, I'm thinking of you. And then the time of death, I may be all choked up and so forth with mucus. And this actually happens with the coronavirus, as I understand it. The lungs become blocked and liquid and you, you may suffocate. So when I was preparing for this class, I was thinking it, it's really interesting. You know, we have... Prabhupada's talking about high fever, then he's talking about the story of Shiva Jvara, it protects you from high fever, and then this prayer of King Kulakshetra, uh, that, that when I die, I, I may be deranged, and Prabhupada is saying this also. Um, so I'm praying, I'm praying now, two things. One is King Kulakshetra is praying, well, maybe I could die now, but the other, Prabhupada's saying, you can pray when you're in a healthy state, you can pray that you can remember Krishna when you die. Now, here's the thing. I began by saying, and then we read that Prabhupada was saying, practice, 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 practice. Life is a practice for this moment. And so, what are you practicing for? You're practicing to remember Krishna. Okay, so let, let's say here, this is a game, it's a sporting event, and we're practicing, and the goal is to remember Krishna, and whoever remembers Krishna the most wins the game. And so in the game, there's all these difficult situations you have to go through, and you try to put your opponent into states of misery and torture so they forget Krishna. That's an interesting game, right? Okay, I just made it up, but let's say. So, so the goal of the game is you have to remember Krishna through all of that, and so life is like that. And so... In so many places, Prabhupada would say, the goal is to remember Krishna, to be absorbed in Krishna. Um, always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. Um, chant, when you chant the holy name, the, you know, devotees say, we can talk about this another time, devotees say, a lot of times we hear, you just hear the name, just focus on hearing and Prabhupada did say that, but Prabhupada said something else. He said that the goal of chanting is to be absorbed in Krishna's nam rup guna lila, to be absorbed not in just hearing the name, but in his form, qualities, and pastimes. He said, but if you can't do that, if you can't be absorbed in thinking of his pastimes and form and qualities, then... <laughs> well, yeah, you want to... Well, <laughs> come on here, let me... Answer is If you can't do that, then just hear. But the point is to be absorbed in the, the qualities, the form, the qualities, and the pastimes. So, okay, so we go back to the game. This life is this game, and life is pushing us this way and pushing us that way, and we're practicing being absorbed in Krishna. That's the practice. So that the ultimate goal, when you're at that point, when you're going to leave your body, you are so practiced in thinking of Krishna, you're totally ready for it. Just like a boxer, he has to work out intensely so he can be ready for the fight. And so Krishna is putting us in all these situations we have to fight through and gain our strength so we can remember him. So that's the idea. Simple idea, isn't it? Now, you know that some, sometimes when things are difficult, rather than taking shelter of Krishna, you could lose faith in Krishna. Krishna, why are you doing this to me? Sometimes devotees even leave, leave Krishna consciousness if things get difficult. Krishna, why are you doing this to me? I don't, I don't believe in you or accept you or whatever. So that totally goes against everything that's being taught here. Ante Narayana Smriti and... and Life may be difficult, but death is probably going to be more difficult. So if you give up your Krishna consciousness when life is difficult, how are you going to prepare for the time of death? That's the point. 
So when things are difficult, we're supposed to be more Krishna conscious. We, we're supposed to train ourselves to take more shelter. Because if we don't, what happens at the time of death when you're leaving everything and you're going crazy? It makes sense, doesn't it? Now, years ago in Alachua, I gave a class and I was and I was realizing while I was giving the class that death is one of the best things that ever happened for being Krishna conscious. And the reason I said that is because like you know anything about goals, if there's no if there's no date that it's due, it just goes on forever. Like when do we want to get this done? Well, as soon as we can. You know, it just keeps going and going. When you put a date on it, it has to be done by this date, somehow it gets done. Right? So there's an expiration date. And we don't know the exact expiration date, but we know there's an expiration date. So that's good. That's what helps make us more serious. And so we don't want to die, and death is painful, and we see other people die, and we see loved ones die, and it's all a reminder, oh yeah, that's my position. Yeah, what I once said, press the Hare Krishna button, not the panic button. Yeah. So all these things help us. Krishna created all of this to help us. We need it. And if, if life is too long and we don't see death and we're not getting old and gray hairs and wrinkles, we, we just put it out of our mind. But So Krishna created this temporary nature of this body and world to actually help us tremendously. So if we can put death in that context, that is actually good. Now, a lot of people are putting posts on Facebook that, you know, this coronavirus is it's making us think more. And one thing it's doing, at least for devotees, it's just bringing into focus the realities that, as I said yesterday, that sometimes we try to keep out of focus because they're kind of depressing. We just want to be happy and peaceful. Who wants to think about death? It's a morbid thought. But actually, <laughs> the reality is that as devotees, we're supposed to think about death as we can see from these verses that they're about death. And, and Sukadev Goswami didn't say, oh, why do you have to talk about death? It's so depressing. He said, what a good question. I'm so glad you asked that question. This is the best question. And everybody should be talking about death. Basically, that's what he's saying. Everyone should be talking about death. This is, this is what you're supposed to be talking about. Nobody's talking about death. Everybody's talking about their next vacation how they're going to make more money, how they're going to, you know, find this girl or guy and get married and move to their favorite place. That's what everybody's talking about. Nobody's talking about, I could die and I have to be Krishna conscious. So when that question is asked, he's saying, yes, this is the question. This is a good question. Nobody, nobody asked this question. Only someone intelligent would ask this question. You know, you find out you have seven days to live your question is, how do I get to Disney World as fast as I can? I've never been there. I want to see it, right? What a wasted life. So this is from a, I believe it's from a letter, 1975, February. Or it could be a lecture in Mayapur. No, no, no. Oh, this is a great one. This is a great one. So here's the context. I was there. Prabhupada wrote this letter. I was, well, I came after, but I know the context. So there's a devotee named Odalami. Odalami was a married man who had heart complication, and the doctor told him he only has a few months to live, or maybe six months. So he asked Prabhupada if he could become a Babaji and just chant all day and prepare to live. So he left his wife, he put on white. He was wearing, like the Goswamis, just a little half cloth, gumsha, white, and no shirt. And he was just chanting all day. So this is what Prabhupada says to him, and this is this is what is so important in, in the context that Prabhupada's coming from. This is Prabhupada's context. context. It is the mercy of Krishna that you are getting fair warning of your nearing death. So rather... You know, if we, we hear Odalami has a heart problem, he's going to die, our natural instinct is, well, that's so bad. So unfortunate, because he was, at that time, probably 
25, 26, 27 maximum, maybe even only 23. I was 25 at that time. And he would only be one or two years older or younger. So we think, such a young man, he has a heart disease, he's going to die. That is so sad. That's our first response from a material perspective. Right? Isn't it? So Prabhupada says, it's, it is the mercy of Krishna that you are getting fair warning of your nearing death. Now you must become very serious to prepare to meet death without fear by being fully absorbed in the lotus feet of Krishna. You must be very careful and always praying to Krishna that you will not forget him at the time of dying. So now Prabhupada's saying, okay, this is really good. <laughs> he's not saying, oh, this is so bad. He's saying, hey, this is good news. You know you're going to die. That's really good. If you know you have a certain amount of time, then you can prepare. So the Prabhupada says, okay, so since you know you can prepare, your business now is to prepare. You must be very careful, always praying to Krishna that you will not forget him at the time of dying. So we had read previously that Prabhupada said that we should prepare to die. That's what life is for. And especially if we have this calling, we should be preparing. So life is a preparation to meet death. If you know you're going to die, it's the final, you know, cramming for the final exam. If your heart is weak, do not take part in so much service. It will be better for you to chant more, read more, eat less. Like that, you can engage yourself. Everyone has to die sometime, but the problem is that most men your age are thinking, I will live another 50 years. But now you have been informed that in your case, you will not live so long. Take advantage of this advice, advance notice, excuse me, Consider it a blessing and prepare yourself to go back home, back to God. So look at Prabhupada's attitude. Prabhupada's attitude is to get everyone back to Godhead. That's what Prabhupada came for, right? So Prabhupada's looking at his disciple and he's thinking, you are in such a good situation. You know you're going to die. You can prepare yourself fully for going back to Godhead and just sit down and chant. And then he's saying, most people your age think, well, they're not going to die for another 50 years. That's not true. Number one, it's not true. And number two, this is glorious. So even though you're 25 years old, you can die in Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's not thinking it's glorious if you could live 100 years. He's thinking it's glorious that you could die at any time in Krishna consciousness. It doesn't matter how old you are. So that goes against the grain of thinking, right? Oh, Odalami, he was such a young man that he had to die. Anyway, he never died. He, got, he was cured. And this is a side point. I was there. I lived next to him. I was in Detroit in 1975. And he was living there, and I was in the room next to him. And he stayed up all night and chanted. He only ate, because he was Babaji, he only ate when they brought him prasadam. He couldn't go down to get it. So you hardly saw him. And when the doctor told him, you're not going to die, he gave up Babaji, he went back with his wife, and I think he even may have left Krishna consciousness. So it would have been better for him to have died at 25, don't you think? As far as I re remember, that's what I was told. He definitely went back to his wife, and I haven't seen him or heard about him, and I was told he left Krishna consciousness. So it would have been better that he would have died, right? And prepared and in a few months died and gone back to Godhead. So Prabhupada is trying to get us to go back to Godhead. If he can get a 25-year-old to go back to Godhead, fine. You went back to Godhead 50 years earlier than most people. What's wrong with that? No problem. We say, oh, such a young man, you know, this and that. What Prabhupada's saying, Prabhupada's saying in a different context. Prabhupada's context, I've told you this story. Some of you have heard this story. In 1975, in Mayapur, Prabhupada's on a morning walk. And he drops the bomb, there's going to be World War III, everyone. Oh my God. So when Prabhupada, you can hear this, it's recorded, when Prabhupada dropped the bomb, one devotee is saying, well, what should we do? Should we take precaution? Should we move our deities to places which would not be considered nuclear targets and so forth? And Prabhupada was almost laughing. And he turned to the devotee and said, do you think you're not going to die? You're going to die if you don't die of the nuclear weapon, you know, next month. 
you're still going to die. It doesn't matter. Fifty years, it's all insignificant. So he was, he was shaking us up, shaking our minds and saying, you know, if you die now in 50 years, it's not really different. But from our material point of view, we think, well, if you die when you're 25, that's really bad. That's really sad. You're so young. You had your whole life ahead of you. But if you, you can prepare yourself to be Krishna conscious and go back to Godhead, why do you need a whole life ahead of you? What are you going to do with that life? Okay. You can serve, you can preach, that's fine. But if by Krishna's desire, you can go back to Godhead, why not? And so there's, so, you know, people don't think like this. And it even, it even makes Prabhupada look like, like in a sense, from the material point of view, people could think, oh, he's so hard-hearted, he doesn't even care. And then there's another story, Jayananda Prabhu. Jayananda Prabhu has leukemia. He's going for alternative therapy. He's spending a lot of time and a lot of money on this therapy, and he's not really getting much better. I think he was getting a little better, but he wasn't satisfied with the results. And his service in sadhana was compromised in the hospital, and he didn't like it because they wouldn't let him preach there. He really wanted to preach. So at one point he wrote Prabhupada a letter. He said, I'm spending so much time and money, I don't... I don't want to stay in the hospital and try to cure. I just want to let this disease kill me. And Prabhupada agreed. He said, yes. Why spend all this, mo all this energy and money and time to try to stay alive? What, you know, if that were your father, that were your mother, your brother, your sister, your son, daughter, you would probably say no. We'll spend all our money, we'll put all our time and energy, save him, save him. The Prabhupada's saying, yeah, why put in the energy? Because Prabhupada's thinking, you can just die in Krishna consciousness and go back to Godhead. So why spend the last months of your life just trying to stay healthy when it looks like it's a losing battle? So he agreed, just die in Krishna consciousness. So you see the context Prabhupada's in. He's the guru. His mission is to get us back to Godhead. If he can, Jayananda at that time, that was, when was that? It was 1976, I think, he died. May of 76. So he was probably like 36, 37, something like that at the most. That's still young to die. But yeah, you know, you've, you've done your seva, You've done so much service. Prabhupada thanked him. Thank you so much for starting Rathiatra. He started Rathiatra in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles. And, um, you know, maybe it was 1970, maybe it was May 77. And then a lot of devotees, this was also interesting. He died, maybe it was 1977. It had to be seven because he was at Rathiatra in 76, so it was 77. Then Prabhupada died November 14th, 1977, and Jayananda died sometime in May of 1977. And so after Prabhupada left, a lot of us began thinking Jayananda was so fortunate to have left his body before Prabhupada because we're suffering like anything and we're having to live through a movement that is being torn apart by separation from Prabhupada. And it's so difficult, so difficult in those years following Prabhupada's departure for many years. And another, a few other God brothers had left, and we, we used to think, um, well, they're fortunate they actually left before. It would have been, it would have been, it would have been, <laughs> we're almost thinking, you know, I'd have been better off dead, not because I would have died but now I have to be separated from Prabhupada in this way. So, uh, yeah, Jayananda Prabhu is amazing. So, that was Prabhupada's attitude. He wasn't at all sentimental, and he wasn't, as, as we could see, Prabhupada wasn't afraid of death. And in his own life, when he knew his time was there, well, he knew, he thought he was going to die many times. And there, if you follow Prabhupada's life, you can see where there's times where he was saying, I may not live much longer because he had a heart attack. He went back to India, I think, 67. And he was in San Francisco, as far as I remember. 
He left from San Francisco. Actually, I can't say. I can't remember. My brain is not clear on this. He came back. He went back to India because he was very ill. Yeah, he was in San Francisco trying to get better, but he wasn't getting better. And he said, I have to go back to India. Weather is better, Ayurvedic medicine. And the devotees didn't know if he was coming back, and he didn't know if he was coming back. And he would say, I may not live the movements in your hands. This happened several times because Prabhupada's health was not always good, where he would say, he was just very nonchalant, like, I, my time is up, you're young, at any moment I could die. And um, this was the theme, and Prabhupada accepted it. And then eventually in 77, Prabhupada felt the call was there, and he said, I want to go back to Vrindavan to leave. And as everyone observed, Prabhupada was in it was total dira, completely sober the whole time, just incredible, never affected by the disease or by, by how run down his body was. It was just amazing. And the Prabhupada was never like that. He was never affected. So I was thinking, I was actually reading that this morning, and I was thinking, if we're very affected by disease and difficulty, it should be a little bit of a concern because death is, a lot is, is difficult and there's discomfort as there is with disease. So disease and discomfort is a sense of practice and uh, for tolerating what we may need to tolerate so we can be sober at the time of the death. So that's just the thought. And um, I just want to read a few more things and we'll take questions. This is... Um, now this is... This next quote... It, it, it's a little bit of off on a tangent, but it relates to the current situation of the coronavirus. There are many things out on the internet that we're told we can do to prevent it. I just read, I just heard today, ginger, turmeric, turmeric root, ginger root, and aloe vera. That makes you so strong that the virus will not take hold in your body. Okay, sounds good. I was also told ginger... Uh, I put something out the other day, things you can do. Uh, drink hot water every 20 minutes. Uh, we've also heard the virus can't exist in warm weather over 133 Fahrenheit, which is something like 45 or 50 centigrade. And so people are inhaling hair dryer or steam to kill. You know, so there's so many things. And, and as I said yesterday, Prabhupada, he said, you know, take precaution, do what you can. But here's an interesting, I believe this is a letter, this is very interesting. Life cannot be prolonged by heart transplant. Isn't that interesting? Life cannot be prolonged by heart transplant. You cannot increase the duration of life. One can perhaps give some relief to disease. That is another thing. But the duration of life is destined. From the dead body, one cannot bring life. Similarly, listen to this. If you're not awake, time to get become awake. It may appear. Yeah, let's make this louder. Bring the mic closer. This is a nice statement. Even closer. It, it may appear that one is prolonging the duration of life by medicine or heart transplant, but that is not the case. If one lives four years after having had a heart transplant, then by nature's law, he was destined to live four years with or without having a heart transplant. So what is the value of the heart transplant? That's really interesting. Isn't it? That could be the source of controversy. But someone could say, well, maybe this, that, and the next thing. But whatever. Let's take it at face value. And we had discussed this yesterday, that can a, can a plague or a famine 
or a pandemic interfere with people's karma, or is it just is it just facilitating their karma? So, based on what we know, it's facilitating karma. So, it doesn't mean we don't take precaution. We 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 stay home, take care of ourselves, do what we're told, wash our hands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Stay away from people. We take all precaution. But if we're meant to live or we're meant to die, that's there. But let me read a little more. Only by the yoga process can one prolong the life. That's interesting. By stopping the breathing, keeping in samadhi, the breath period is being not being misused. <laughs> you stop. You have so many breaths. You're, at the time you're born, you'll have 10 zillion breaths, right? So you do yoga and you stop in the breath, so you live longer. And you're running, <laughs> and it shortens your life. By stopping the breathing process, keeping in samadhi, the breath period is not being misused, and he increases the lifespan. Therefore, destiny can only be changed by devotional service or yoga. Otherwise, what you must suffer, you must suffer, and what you must enjoy, you must enjoy. For a devotee, however, so here's however, pay attention, please. Whatever it may be, he takes the opportunity to chant Hare Krishna. And if by Krishna's grace, destiny is changed, then it is all right. So he's saying, Prabhupada's saying, you may have your karma, but Krishna can change that if that's what Krishna wants. And if Krishna is willing to change it, then you accept that, obviously. Nature's law will work. We cannot change that. But Krishna, the Supreme Controller, he can change it. Just like if a man is sentenced to be hanged, no one, not even the judge, can pardon him except the king or president. Interesting. He can only excuse the offender. Similarly, I have to execute Krishna's order, and suppose I have to suffer to execute this order. Therefore, devotional service and the devotee is so dear to Krishna. So, Prabhupada saying the devotee he doesn't care so much about his suffering or his enjoyment, and Krishna can either give his karma or remove his karma. He's okay either way. He wants to serve Krishna. So if you know you go back to the second chapter and Krishna's saying, Arjun, fight happiness or distress. So really, really this this point of not being affected so much by the material world is really the practice which enables one to be Krishna conscious at the time of death. And so now we're surrounded by the fact that many, many people are dying, especially I told many, many people, like 400 people died yesterday in Italy. So it's not good, but it's a reminder to us that Prabhupada has come to help us transcend, eternally transcend death. And so we're so fortunate that we can do that and take advantage of that. So that's why I wanted to talk about these things. Um, one more thing and then we'll take questions. And then we can discuss this more tomorrow because there's more here. Let this set in. Um, and then I'll read this. We'll discuss, oops, we'll discuss this last point. And then I just wanted to summarize this a little bit. This is another angle on this, which I think is important. Regarding your prediction of cataclysmic earthquakes in the side of your country, in this side of your country, I don't, I don't know what was going on at that point. There was um, apparently some prediction that the country would be destroyed. Your fear of my life is certainly natural. I was a bad child of my father. In other words, there, Prabhupada is somewhere and there's prediction of a cataclysmic earthquake. So he's saying, well, your fear is natural. I was pet child of my father, whom I lost in 1930. That meant Prabhupada was 34 years old. And since then, nobody was taking care of me as affectionate son, but Krishna has sent me so many fathers to take care of me in a far distant place. So I'm fortunate that all of you are so anxious. But... We must always depend on Krishna. 
So even Prabhupada saying, I'm taken care of. But he sees it differently. Ultimately, Krishna is doing it. Rest assured that this nonsense idea of cataclysmic, er cataclysmic earthquakes will never take place. And even if it takes place, why should we be afraid of it? As soon as there is a sign of such earthquake, earthquake, we shall sit down together and chant Hare Krishna. So it will be a great opportunity of meeting death while chanting Hare Krishna. If one dies in sound condition of body and mind, chanting Hare Krishna, he's the most fortunate man. So that kind of sums up, that last sentence kind of sums up what we've been discussing. Let me read the last two sentences. When I was reading this, I was thinking, okay, you know, you have this pandemic and it's problematic, so it's similar to the situation Prabhupada is describing. As soon as there is sign of such earthquake, we shall sit down together and chant Hare Krishna. Well, there's an earthquake. We'll sit down and maybe we'll all go back to God. <laughs> that is a very transcendental way of thinking. So it will be a great opportunity of meeting death while chanting Hare Krishna. If one dies in sound condition of body and mind, chanting Hare Krishna, he's the most fortunate man. Wow. So again, it's the same point. And Prabhupada's saying, you know, it's not a misfortune. If you die in Krishna consciousness, it's a great fortune. So why would you lament? And again, my other point is, so you could live longer. That's fine. And then you'll still die. So Prabhupada's point is, if you can die now in Krishna consciousness, don't lament. It's not a great advantage to live longer. Of course, we... Okay, let me give the other side of the equation. We feel separation from devotees. We want devotees to live a long time because we want their association. We want, and we, they want to do service. We want to do service. All these things are there. So that's a natural sentiment. And we want our spiritual master to live a long time because we want to be with him and get his inspiration. And it's a great, the world loses when the sadhu leaves. But Prabhupada's speaking more from the pers our personal perspective. If this is the situation, we have to learn to embrace it with detachment and say, okay, this must be what Krishna wants. And then you can expand on that because now, the way the world's going, the economy, if, if the virus problem continues, countries are shutting down. And so it's not business as usual. The money's not flowing. People are not working. People are getting laid off. It, it could potentially create huge economic disaster. So it's just, a, it's another, it's another thing to be concerned about. And um, as you know, if you've been following this problem that because the number of cases has spiked so quickly there's not enough hospitals, not enough beds, not enough respirators, not enough medicine. And so some people they just have to leave to die. Like okay you're over a certain age we're not going to save you. So these are these are realities that we as devotees should learn to deal with. Okay, so questions. Now I have to go back because you may have some questions. So I have to go way back to the beginning. And see if there are any questions. And if you have any questions, you can ask now. And as I once said, when Prabhupada asked for questions and there weren't any, Prabhupada said, what? You know, you know everything? <laughs> you have no questions? You know everything? Questions are good, it means you're thinking. But maybe you're all depressed now because this is like, I don't want to die. You're making it sound like it's no problem. Oh, I want to, um, I want to mention one other thing that I think you're aware of, but it's always good to appreciate something because even though we're aware of it, we don't always appreciate it. And 
Uh, Shravania, uh, she's from Poland, she lives in England, and her this year she lost her parents, not at the same time. She recently lost her father. And, and we all know how difficult it is to lose loved ones, and especially parents. And, and whenever this happens, I think, I always think, we are so fortunate because we have knowledge to help us cope with this. We have knowledge to help us understand this. We have knowledge to help us get through this. And we could imagine if we weren't Krishna conscious, we'd just be complete wrecks like all our relatives and are when a loved one dies. So even though it's painful, we may lose God brothers, we may lose relatives, friends, even though it's painful. We're so fortunate. The Prophet has given us knowledge by which we can deal with it, cope with it. Shravani is watching. Press the Hare Krishna button. Don't press the panic button. I have a question. Krishna Krishna. How to be aware of death and not to be depressed? It's difficult to function in this world being depressed. We still have to function in this world. So we cannot think of death all the time. Well, one of the thoughts that, as you know, I was talking about probably in Mayapur and other places was this idea. Well, in the class I gave in Mayapur, you may remember that I mentioned that many, many times in Prabhupada's classes, he ended the class with him, go back home, back to Kaida. Do, do A, B, C, and D, which A, B, C, and D was what Prabhupada described in the class. And if you do this, then be happy, go back home, back to Kaida. You can see Krishna, you can dance with Krishna. I have one quote like that we'll read tomorrow. And so when you meditate on that, it's, it's a beautiful meditation because I believe it's the fifth chapter the life of Narada Muni of the first canto, fifth or sixth, it describes that when a devotee dies, it's like, you know, death is heavy, but immediately he goes to Krishna in, in Leela or back to Krishna directly. And so it's such a glorious death and a glorious experience. So if you think of death as something horrible, you're going to lose everything of this world, all your friends and so forth, and all your sense gratification, which, which is really what we're afraid of, then, yeah, it's going to be depressing. If you're thinking, I'm entering Krishna Leela, I'm going to be able to dance with Krishna. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Or, Prabhupada said, but if you don't become perfect, if you're not thinking of Krishna, you'll be born in a devotee family. That's pretty exciting also. So for us, dying is just better. Everything gets better when we die. We're thinking, oh no, it's going to get worse or it's unknown. It can't get worse. It can only get better. Either you'll be born in a devotee family or you'll be, and then all these, you know, samskaras of rock and roll and sense gratification. You won't grow up with those samskars. You'll grow up with better samskars. Um, or you'll go back to Godhead and you'll be dancing with Krishna or playing with Krishna or like that, serving Krishna in some way. So that's the context you have to see it in. It's that death is not depressing. Actually, in a, a sense for us, it's it's like probably the most exciting thing that could ever happen. From the external point of view, from the material point of view, because your body's breaking down and your material, you can't enjoy the material world and material body, it looks bad. But internally, your Krishna consciousness is developing. And so you're so happy. That's how I would look at it. It's not at all depressing, it's quite exciting. The question arises, Krishna uh, Karshini asks again, the question arises why we don't know the date of our death. Maybe it would be easier to prepare. Why it's created in a way that our death is unknown. Because as we're discussing here, wow, you can go find someone to bring us Amita. He can tell you all about everything, your last life, your next life. 
because as we we're discussing here, you, human life, it's, it's, it's like right now we're supposed to be Krishna conscious. Today, it's like Prabhupada, when he would talk about Pariksha Maharaj, he'd say, look, at, you should be like Pariksha Maharaj. You, you don't know, you could die today. You just don't know, you should be prepared. So that's the idea, that you're always prepared. And one time, I think Prabhupada may have told Satsurup Maharaj, he said, deal with every day like it's your last day. He says, you know, he said, then that's how you become serious. So as I was saying, death has such a sobering function, has, has such a, and maybe you could say inspiring function to inspire us that this is the expiration date, we have to get the job done, this is the due date. Um, if, okay, if I say, well, Krishna Krishna, you're not gonna die until the year 2050. So I think, oh, I have 30 years. I'll be going on vacation. I'll come back in 10. But if I say, Krishna Krishna, you don't know if you have even one day. You think, oh, I better get serious. So that's, what, that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, so then Kamini is saying that the devotee Odalami, who thought he was going to die but didn't, he would have been spared so much suffering. So that's, okay, let, let's tell another story. So they're on a morning walk and Prabhupada's talking about celibacy. And one devotee says, Srila Prabhupada, if, if we're all celibate, then there won't be any children. And Prabhupada said, but you don't need to bring people to this planet because this planet is only for people who want to enjoy. So it doesn't have any other function. Its only function is for people who don't want to be Krishna conscious. So we think, oh, he lived a short life, could have lived longer and enjoyed. But the planet, if there's no people who want to leave, who want to come to the world and forget Krishna, there's no need for the planet. So, you think, well, if there's no need and nobody comes here, then from the material point of view, they think, well, that, that's not good. We need people. We need to be productive and we need to grow the economy and we need to make things happen. And the answer is, no, you don't. That's just for those who want to be separate from Krishna. But if you want to be with Krishna, you don't need to come here. And if no one wants to come here, this world is not needed. It serves no function. So that's the idea. So, you know, if he would have died when he's 25 and gone back to Godhead, wow, he would have gone back to Godhead 50 years before most of his God brothers. Fine. Sounds good. Rasa Prada says, a lot of people, including myself, sometimes we live life in a theater mood. Curtain is in front of us and we're waiting for the good act until the curtain opens up. There's this black space. And we ask, where are the actors? And just one person shows up and said, there's no show, it's been canceled. We're going into a panic stage because there's no act. We just think about the money that we pay. That is the only word reaction for us. I'm not exactly sure what you meant. I think you mean life is not the way we planned. Um, and well, at least we can't control, you know, there, if we could accept death positively, if we could accept all the things we can't control, if we could be steady no matter what's going on, then wow, our material life and our spiritual life would be so much better. Kamaniya says, when a great soul like Prabhupada says such a thing regarding leaving the body, we know that it's out of endless compassion. But then when a neophyte, for example, such as me, were to say such a thing, 
see more. It can definitely come across as being hard, hearted, and inappropriate. Why is that? Is it because I am simply parroting it? Because I have yet to realize it? Um, that could be. I think, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. You know, the spiritual master is supposed to give the tatwa, and friends are supposed to sympathize. So if you're a friend and you just give the tatva like you're the guru, it's kind of, well, Prabhu, you know, if you don't die today, you die tomorrow, so why lament? And it's all Krishna's mercy and, you know, give me a call if you need me and, you know, good luck, you know. Friends don't do that. So it's not going to come across so well. But if you're the guru, then you give the tatva and... You know, someone has to separate from their body. It's a big attachment. And the Guru's words are meant to break attachments. So, that's how it works. Guru's going to, so, yeah, you know, I, we had this discussion once many, many years ago in Los Angeles. And um, someone was making the point, even I, it might have been me, that you, know, you have to be sympathetic. But you still can't compromise the truth. But so then Jaitwaja Swami said, well, how do you do that? Or, I don't know if he was challenging me or asking for clarification. And I, and I felt that you sympathize with their suffering at the same time you give them the knowledge that will help them. So, as I said, we're fortunate that we have that knowledge and we're unfortunate if we don't take advantage of that knowledge. That's what I find. I, feel, I find it sad when devotees are undergoing some difficulty for which Prabhupada has given the solution and they're unnecessarily depressed or lamenting when, in fact, the knowledge we have would solve that. Kamaniya says, what is the most compassionate thing that someone like me can say to, what approach should I take with someone else who is not yet Krishna conscious when discussing the process of death and dying? Depends on the context and it depends on the person. Now you mean someone's in the process, they're leaving their body, then... You, there's this man who wrote Conversations with God. And he said, he told his mother, I never want you to die when she was young. Excuse me, when he was young. Well, she was younger also. When he was young, he said, Mother, I don't want you to die. And she said, no, that's not going to happen. I have to die. He said, but when I die, dance in my grave, celebrate then I'm, I'm with God. So then he started sell, sell, saying, from that experience with his mother, he started saying, well, death is just a going away party. And, you know, some people could find that insensitive. But, you're, you know, you explain that you're just moving. You're moving to another place. And right now, if you become more God conscious, you can move to a better place. So let's work on that because you're in transition and you have an opportunity to transition. Now, we gave that example of the parrot. When the parrot dies, he just squawks and Prabhupada said, because he never practiced genuinely being Krishna conscious. That was just imitation. So you might say, well, how far can this woman progress? She could progress to the point of becoming a devotee in her next life if she begins practicing. So that's where I would start. I've, I've found that, you know, people... People in that position, they're so receptive. They're so receptive if they know they're leaving their body. So it's a really the, the best time. And um, you know, I, I never understood why we don't do more preaching, hospice preaching and hospital preaching, because it's the best time. 
that's when they're the most open for answers, at least some people. Uh, Ram Govinda says, in that letter, Prabhupada states that death is predetermined and only bhakti or devotional service extends it, not modern medicine. And even a pandemic doesn't interfere with the karma is the same principle. When someone takes their own life, does that interference with karma? Yeah. Or is well predetermined? We would say, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Okay, if I kill myself, I'm not supposed to, but I become a ghost because it's said that you're destined to live for a certain time and you've interfered with your destiny. So, and so therefore you have to remain a ghost till your next body's ready because according to destiny you should have lived 50 years, you killed yourself at 25, you have 25 years to live without a body until your next body's ready. So yes, you've interfered with your destiny by killing yourself. But apparently if someone else kills you, that was not an interference with your destiny, that was it. As Krishna says in the Gita, karma is uh, action, what is action, what is not action, this and that, he said, it's difficult to understand. You know, the more you talk about it, the more subtle it is, and then you understand that certain things are just not maybe so straightforward from the way we'd like, we'd like everything to be just in a box. But that's the idea. Prophet said, you'll make a certain amount of money, it'll happen. You'll live a certain length of life, it'll happen. You'll have a certain amount of happiness, it'll happen. But then Gita says, do your duty. So it doesn't mean you sit around. So that's how we become detached. Like, okay, it's, it's, you know, I have to work, but it's going to happen a certain way. I try my best. I try to do my best as a father, as a mother, as a husband, a wife, a servant in the temple, Pujari, Sankirtan, spiritual master, teacher, whatever. And that's all I can do. And everything else will happen. That's a good question. What if while chanting, I'm thinking of Krishna but not really pray, paying attention to the sound vibrations of the holy name? What are you paying attention to? If you're thinking of Krishna, you're paying attention to Krishna. So the thing is, Krishna, if you're paying, Krishna is not different than his name. So if you're thinking of Krishna's form, Krishna's form is in his name. So. In that sense, you're, you can't be doing one without the other. You're, you're, if you're absorbed in Krishna, you're absorbed in Krishna. And that's the goal of chanting. Nam Rupa Guna Lila, it's all one. It's the same Krishna. What is the role of our efforts under any situation considering this situation also? Do your best. You don't, you don't really know what your karma will be. So you do your best according to your intelligence and then accept the results. It's all you can do. It's the only thing that makes sense. But be detached. Do your best, be detached. Dalia Dasi, how can I improve my chanting? You get my book, Chapa Affirmations, on Amazon. That's how. Or you listen, you can listen to many, many lectures I've given. Um, go to my SoundCloud, there's lots and things I've written. It will all help you. Jagannath Priya, thanks so much. Is there any particular prayer we can make for our non devotee relatives at this moment? since they're living in different countries. Since they're living in different countries and we don't have possibility to assist them or giving them prasad. 
Well, it's an interesting question because if I pray for the material welfare of someone, well, naturally a devotee, you know, he wants to see everybody happy and peaceful. But really, at heart, a devotee wants to see everyone become Krishna conscious. So we can pray that Krishna bestows mercy upon them, gives them some insight in such a way that their inclination for spiritual life increases. Because if we just play for the material well-being of people, it's, it just facilitates their material life, and that's not really how a devotee would pray. He wouldn't pray in a way that would facilitate material, the material life of people. Of course, if they're your relatives, naturally you want them to be happy. But still, the real blessing of the Vaishnava is the blessing to be Krishna conscious. You know, I don't want to sound hard-hearted, but you know that story of Thakur Haridas when he was in jail and the prisoner said, please get us out. And he said, oh, better, you, better you stay here. If you get out, you'll be engaged in material activity. Here, you can't really do any material activity, so why would I pray to get you out? So you have to keep that in mind. The devotee wouldn't pray for the material benefit of people. And when people would, at least there's one story, when some men asked Prabhupada for blessings, he said, what kind of blessings do you want? And so naturally, blessing means the family is healthy, the children are well-educated, they have good jobs, there's wealth, and so forth. The prophet said, I don't give those blessings. So that's interesting. That's not the kind of blessings that Vaishnav gives. And one time they said, Prabhupada, can we create a rumor that that Radharasa Bihari gives a certain blessing and more people will come. Prabhupada said, no, we don't want to attract people who are coming for material blessings. So we can pray for the spiritual well-being of everyone and your relatives as well. To pray for their material well-being, yes, it's natural, but if you must do that, Pray for their spiritual well-being at the same time. Because if they're going to... And then, you know, it was also the reality that maybe they have their karma and that's what they're supposed to go through. And, or Krishna wants them to go through that. So that's also the mood of the devotee. It's an interesting topic. The devotee's kind. He doesn't want to see people suffer. That's his nature. But he doesn't want to people see people entangled in the material world. What does it mean, Raphael saying, what does it mean Krishna consciousness, body and mind, a practical platform? Engaging the body and the mind, practically in service. Kamal asks, is a higher state of consciousness not to desire to go back to Godhead, but only to desire to remain in devotional service? Yeah, that is. But you can't imitate that. So, <laughs> you know my answer to this question is, if you have to, is it, should I desire only go back to Godhead or should I desire liberation? The answer is, if you've asked the question, the answer is you should desire to go back to Godhead. Because if you're advanced enough, you won't desire to go back to Godhead, so then you wouldn't answer, you wouldn't ask the question. I think that's the simplest answer I can give. And I was reading this morning or the other morning how, I was reading this morning, okay, I'll tell you the story. You probably, maybe you've heard this story, but Rupa Goswami made some sweet rice for Sanatana Goswami because Sanatana Goswami loves sweet rice. And so when he gave him the sweet rice and Sanatana Goswami tasted it, it wasn't, it wasn't ordinary sweet rice. And he said, where do you get this ingre these ingredients? Because this sweet rice is not, it's not really of this world. He said, well, there's this young girl who gave them to me. So he asked for some description of what this girl is like, etc. Then he realized it was Radharani. And he chastised Rupa Goswami. 
course, this is Leela. He said, he said, we're trying, you know, our, high aspir- our highest aspiration is to serve the feet of Radharani, and you've taken servant- service from her, and that's like horrible, and he wouldn't eat the sweet rice, or something like that. It was just, he was really upset. That, and so, in the commentary there, it's saying even, even the devotee doesn't have anything. Like the example was Madhavendra Puri. He didn't have anything to eat, and Krishna came and gave him something. But then even beyond that, a devotee doesn't even want to take from Krishna. He always wants to give but never take. So that, that is the highest state. But if you don't have that state, then you ask this question. And if you don't have that state, then the desire to get out of the material world is good for you. Because you might remain here forever if you don't have a desire to get out. So all the talk of how bad this world is, it's all motivating. But at a certain point, you're not so absorbed in talking about how bad the world is because you're just, you don't care. You just want to serve Krishna wherever he wants you to go. So that stage may come or may not come, but when it comes, you'll know it comes. And then you won't have the question. Uh, I started using your job affirmations book and I read one affirmation before every job in the morning. But after some time, I forgot all about <laughs> affirmation. And my mind is back. How can I keep read it again? And feel it, don't think it. it if you go into feeling, if you feel it, the affirmations are meant to be felt, not thought. So that's the point. Think it, don't feel it. Or keep reading it as needed. If I'm sick and I don't take care of my health, this is like giving up the opportunity to help Prabhupada. Yeah. Take care of your health. Be healthy so you can live to serve Krishna. As King Kulakshak Shekhar said, it is better to die Krishna conscious now than live a long life and run the risk of leaving the body in another state. Yes. But as Prabhupada said, now you can thank Krishna help me remember you at the time of death, even though you're fine and young and healthy. Um... Kamaniya says, I was asking more when discussing generally, not necessarily when someone is actually, yeah. I think, I think it's still the same answer, though. Death is an impetus to um, wake us up, or just the fact that it looms over us. It's an impetus to wake us up. That's the idea, to see it helps us to break through the illusion. There's so much illusion, like we're not going to die, and, you know, we're going to, create some bubble of illusion in this world and there won't be any old age or death and you know, you'll stay young forever and enjoy your body forever. And that's, you know, so death helps break that illusion. And we're very dull and we need something heavy to break through. And even though death's there, for a lot of people it doesn't break through. But that's how I would preach. If someone's a little conscious, then um, they would understand that. I get certain spiritual realization based on my readings, hearing, during chanting, which is a distraction. Yeah, it's just, it's just the context of how you chant. If you chant in the context of getting absorbed in hearing and feeling and praying, then a lot of those realizations won't, they just won't come because they, you'll realize they're distracting you. Now, of course, realizations are good, Sometimes they, you know, they're just gifts. But depending on the context of the platform with which you chant and the mood you're trying to create, then in a mood of calling out and praying, it's not the, the realizations are more intellectualizing things. And the mood of calling and feeling is more of petitioning. And so they're a little bit contradictory. So if you're in the petitioning mode, you may not merge into the realization mode. Maharaj, you think if we get through the virus thing, the humanity may learn something from it? No. They'll learn while it's going on. And we should take the opportunity to go global and preach intensely. They'll remember it. Yeah, I mean, some people will learn, of course, but the fact is 
now it, it's like 9-11. Most people, you know, anyone who's, you know, 18 or older was alive during 9-11. So 18, 19. So they'll, you know, it's just there. It's, it's, the world has changed by it. So as I understand, the coronavirus will not go away. We'll just get control of it, but it'll, it, it'll be a reminder. So I don't, I don't really see that people changing that much unless there's like global destruction. And I don't know if that's part of Krishna's plan. It could be. Prabhupada said that. You know, you know, this morning walk is very scary. Prabhupada was walking in Atlanta and he looked at all the skyscrapers and he said, one day the city will be empty. And this is what he said. You mean later in Kali Yuga? He said, no, in your lifetime. They will leave. They will go. I think he meant they'll leave. It become so hellish. So I don't think we should be surprised by major drastic changes. But my intuition has always been that the changes that are created in the world will be advantageous for preaching and Krishna will do that because we saw that with the hippie movement. We saw that with the fall of communism. There's just arrangements that if they weren't made, it would have made, have preaching, made preaching difficult. Now with the rise of yoga, then previously there was a straight edge movement. There were different things that helped. So I see that it, Krishna kind of does whatever is necessary. And I think people need to be shaken up. Now, if, you know, we lose, if a million people in America die, that would definitely shake people up. If we lose, you know, a billion people in the world die, oh yeah, they're not, no one's going to forget that. And then we could start saying, okay, you're eating meat, you're doing this, you know, then the conversation is, well, this is a karmic reaction. Abortion, cow killing, animal slaughter, etc., etc. Then... That may have to happen, I don't know. That's just a gut intuition that sometimes I have, that if things, you know, if we can't do it by our preaching, Krishna may just like shake it up to make it easier for us. Dolly says, I'm chanting my rounds. I don't have money for my basic expenses for the next months because I don't have a job anymore. Can I wait that Krishna protect me or is this thinking material? Um, I don't want to be the. Res I don't want to be responsible for you. Starving, and it will depend on your realization. Also, and um, but I would have faith in Krishna. Chant and pray and have uh, more than pray. Have faith, and maybe our illustrious president Donald Trump will send you a check, and you'll be fine. Or maybe um, I take shelter in an ashram somewhere and do service. Krishna protects his devotees, but this is a yeah, this is a difficult time. We don't know how, but keep faith. Maybe he'll give you intelligence how to make money in another way, make money online or or some way you can do some service in your local community, like for elderly people who need shopping and food delivered and so Krishna gives you some intelligence and maybe get some money that way. Of course I don't know where you live, but that that's definite there's definite needs right now. Um, go on the street corner and sell toilet paper. You'll do huge. <laughs> toilet paper and antiseptic and hand wash. Make your connection from on the black market and go out and sell it door to door. You'll be doing good. I have leukemia. I would like to cure. What can you, you do or advise me? Um, um, because I'm not a doctor, I don't want to advise you. But um, it depends what stage you're in. If it's stage four, probably the best thing is go to Vrindavan and um, there, all I can say is there's a doctor near Vrindavan that has cured people. The stage four, I believe. 
And if you want to find out about that doctor, I'm not sure I'm the one, but you can write me and I could find out who knows. But it's a difficult regimen. But you can live in Vrindavan while you're taking the medicine. And it's probably a good place to be in if the disease is serious. But, you know, as a spiritual teacher, I don't like to give advice on life and death situations because I, um, it's, it's something you'll have to decide. But I can, I could get you in touch with someone who did the treatment and you could talk to him. His name's Karnamrita. Actually, you can look him up on Facebook. And you can, why don't you talk to him and see? Mm -hmm. Whatever keeps you away from chanting your rounds is not Krishna conscious. Correct. So many questions. Wow. I can, um, okay, Vipo can help you, give you some direction. So you can get in touch with him. He's saying he can help about making money. Okay, so we're going to end. We'll see you tomorrow. As I said, we'll do every day. And we'll, I'm going to go thematically through the Bhagavatam. So we still have some things left to read on this theme. And then as, as themes come up from what I feel is kind of going on in devotees' hearts and minds, then we'll, we'll discuss those. And relevance is... Relevance is um, so important in bhakti. Because we 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 have this problem where we can we can get so theoretical and in and in intellectualizing it it's it's easy to think we understand something because we understand it conceptually, but understanding conceptually and practically, as you know, are two different things. We can understand conceptually all about dying, but now we have to put it in a practical context then. It's like when this devotee said, Prabhupada, should we do this or that to avoid the war? And Prabhupada just laughed and said, you think you're not going to die. And, you know, when you think of it from Prabhupada's perspective, he's saying, look at this, is what I've trained you for. So how, why are you thinking this way? You know, everything in my books is training you for this. I'm like, we're reading these purports, we're seeing it. It's exactly what Prabhupada's saying, training you. And you're worried, and you should be practicing every day for this moment. So that's the challenge. Uh, Hare Krishna. We'll see you tomorrow, and as long as your temple's closed, keep coming, and we'll have Bhagavatam class every day if you're free, and we'll try to go more deeply into the philosophy. And um, as we go, Go more deeply and higher and maybe even get esoteric and totally transcendental. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.